Dogman at the Comic-Con. This story takes place many moons ago when I was a young man around 22. In fact, I'll go so far as to say I was exactly 22. I only made it to 23 by sheer luck though, after the day I came face to fangs with an actual, real-life, dog-headed humanoid. Okay, there was and is a comic convention that occurs in my area in a shopping mall located right next to a small woods that connects to a national forest. I don't want to mention the name or even the state I'm referring to since the Comic Con still exists and I don't want to make trouble for the owners by saying their con is haunted by monsters or anything. The following story took place outside the con in a forested area I probably was not allowed to be in, so all the responsibility for this falls directly on me and the girl I was seeing back in those days. This was a time when cosplay was only beginning to be a thing at cons. You wouldn't see that many people in costume and usually they weren't as elaborate in those days. My girlfriend and I were just wearing jeans and sneakers and she was one of the only females in the entire place. Anime was really only starting to hit America, although it would take over in less than five years. In those days it was mainly about Star Trek, DC, Marvel, and old 60s nostalgia like Batman and Lost in Space. I think the headlining celebrity at the event was Gilligan Bob Denver who told us a cool story about playing Maynard G. Krebs. He told us story after story, I think partially because my girlfriend was basically the only woman there. Or the only woman who knew who Maynard G. Krebs was, at least. So, Comic Cons are fun, but after a while you need a break. We didn't want to leave, but we needed a break, so we bought ourselves some junk food for lunch and then snuck out the back where we weren't supposed to go and wandered off into the woods. We found a clearing with two logs in it that were convenient to sit on, and we just chilled for a while. I noticed my girlfriend did not seem as relaxed as I was and that she seemed to be looking at something off in the distance. Then I heard something in the trees and I started looking over there myself. Under my breath, I asked her if she knew what was over there. She said it was a really tall dude dressed all in black and she wasn't sure, but she thought he might be wearing a mask. Now, to be clear, this figure my girlfriend wasn't 100% certain she had seen was not coming from the direction of the Comic-Con, and to reiterate, we didn't have the expectation of seeing costumed individuals the way we do now. This was some tall, dark figure coming from the forest, walking toward us and the convention. I began to pay closer attention, and our conversation ceased as we both tried to get a better look at whatever was out there. We never could, although we could hear it moving from the right of our field of view to our left, then back again. I'm not trying to say it was invisible, I just mean whoever it was had to have been behind the trees just out of our vision. After a while, my fear and concern turned to annoyance and a touch of anger. My girlfriend said we should go back to the con, but I was young and hot-headed, and I wanted this tall guy to know he had bothered me and my girl. So I got up, but instead of walking back to the con, I walked further into the forest, shouting loudly and dramatically to the figure to show himself and explain himself. For some reason, I was convinced by his lack of reply that I had scared him. Emboldened by this, and against the complaints of my then-girlfriend, I got louder and walked further into the forest, demanding the lurker show himself immediately. I'm not sure how far I walked, but I know I couldn't see my girlfriend behind me anymore. I tromped on and on, shouting rude things to the stalker dude and generally acting like a macho idiot, which I guess is what I was sometimes back then. Don't worry, I learned my lesson about that, and here's how. Satisfied that I had scared off the annoying peeping Tom, I turned to walk back to my girlfriend triumphantly. I had to walk through a narrow passage of trees at one point. As I entered, I shouted out to my girlfriend that I scared the jerk off, and I saw a figure at the other end of the alley of trees appear. I assumed it was her and kept talking to her about what I had seen. Then I heard my girlfriend call out my name from far beyond the figure I saw in front of me. Studying the silhouette in more detail, I saw that this was not the silhouette of a woman or even that of a human. It was far too tall and its legs were all wrong. It looked like it had pointy ears on top of its head. This was not a person at all. This was something more like a werewolf. It was breathing heavily and my first thought was that this is a movie set. Someone must be filming a movie at the Comic-Con, and I accidentally stumbled into their scene. 
I didn't see any cameras, but that didn't mean they weren't there. At that point, I heard a strange noise behind me. I thought at first of a motorboat engine, which made no sense since there was no water behind me. Turning around, I saw, maybe 30 or 40 feet away, another one of these creatures. It was a hairy monster with a dog sort of head, and I could see more details in this one. It was incredibly ugly. It definitely had the ears on top like a dog or bear or cat, but the face was not like anything I have ever seen. It had a kind of a dog face if it had been squashed down, but not like a pug dog. I'm not really sure how to explain it. Imagine if a dog's head were a cake and imagine the cake deflated in places in the oven. It lacked symmetricality somehow. I was looking at it lit from behind and all of this took place in maybe three seconds or four. It had a mouth like a dog, but also like an ape, I guess a gorilla, as it was dark all over. Both its hair or fur and its skin underneath were ebony black. It was quite a striking and imposing creature and it looked like it could tear me apart casually. I really am not sure of the size, but it was alarmingly large and tall. So now, I was looking back and forth, seeing identical monsters at either end of this narrow passage, and it didn't seem like my idea that I was on a movie set was really a valid theory any longer. The trees to my left and right were growing so closely together that it didn't look like I could pass through them. I did anyway. I found I could make better time than I thought I could, although the trees were ridiculously tightly packed for the entire beginning of my little adventure. I wanted to run for a while, then turn left and hope I came out somewhere close to the clearing or the Comic-Con. I wanted to get to safety and get my girlfriend out of danger as well, but the main priority at the moment was to not get torn into pieces by those two tall fellows behind me. So it was painful going as I got torn up by thorns and banged my head pretty hard on a branch because I was idiotically looking behind myself as I walked. But I was feeling out of danger as I turned left and headed back in what I hoped would be the direction of the clearing I last saw my girlfriend at. The trees were still dense, but it was more like woods now than impenetrable forest, and I was making better time. Until I heard someone, or something, in front of me. I stopped moving to listen, and whoever or whatever it was, it was heading toward me. I climbed into an oddly shaped tree and hid myself so I could watch and see what or who was about to walk past. If it was one of those dogmen, I was going to hold my breath and hope it didn't hear or smell me. If it walked past me, I would scramble down the tree and run to the clearing. I wondered what I should do if it did indeed detect me up in the tree, and I never came to a decision about that, because it wasn't a dogman walking toward me. It was my girlfriend. As quickly and quietly as possible, I got out of that tree and ran to her, holding my finger over my lips in the universal sign for a shh. Unfortunately, she understood my meaning. We beat it back to the con where it all seemed like some sort of dream that couldn't possibly have just happened only 200 feet into the forest around a parking lot. I was kind of shaken up, so we talked about it for a while and it turns out she never saw what I saw. She never saw anything more than what she had told me earlier, a tall man in black who might have had a mask on. That was a close enough match to what I saw that this had to be what she saw. And since two of them presented themselves to me, the possibility exists that there might have been even more than two of them in the area. So, what exactly happened? Were these creatures just coincidentally in the area engaged in activities that had nothing to do with us? Were they stalking us? If so, for what reason? Out of curiosity or to hunt us? If they were hunting us, then why did they ignore my girlfriend and come after me in the woods? Wouldn't she have been the easier victim? Is it possible again that they surrounded me in the woods as much out of curiosity as for any other reason? I have a lot of questions about that 15 or 20 minutes of my life and very few answers. I'm not even sure what it was that I saw, obviously. I've been reading about Dogman lately and I guess this was something like that. But most of the descriptions I've read do not involve creatures that were pitch black like these two were. Although I was really in the mood to get far away from there, we hung out for another two hours just to see if a couple in very realistic matching animatronic werewolf costumes came through the door promoting some new movie or something. Obviously, none did. So I'm left with a lot of confusion and questions which bothered me at first. Then one day I was telling this story to a new girlfriend and she asked me outright if I would really want to know all the details about what those things were that I encountered on that day. I had a chill go through my entire body just at her asking me that. After reflection, I had to answer honestly that I don't think I do want to know. I mean, if someone captured a living dog man and can prove what it is, 
I would definitely read every article on that, but on the other hand, I have no plans to go back in the forest and try to find out for myself. The forest is the turf of the dogman, or whatever those creatures are. That's fine with me. I'll stay in the cities and the suburbs, and the dogman can stay past the tree line. As long as we both stay in our own area, everything is better for both sides. That's why these days, if I want a bit of nature, I go for a walk in the city park. I saw a fox turn into a dogman, as told to Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. This here is a story that happened in 1997 when I was 18. It was springtime, and I was feeling it. All I was interested in that year was girls. Some of my girlfriend's parents referred to me as a wolf. But in actuality, my teenage fascination with girls led to me crossing paths with a real-life werewolf. Okay, spring. Warm. Free time. Wandering around town, looking in stores but trying not to buy anything. Bam. There she is. And our story can get started. There was this girl in this store. She was the most stunning girl my teenage eyes had yet beheld. Even at the time, I could not comprehend her appeal. She was dressed like she had come home from work, but in some way she seemed done up fully. I don't understand the things that women do. Maybe it was her makeup or her hair or her way of standing and moving, but everything about her spoke loudly to me. It said, I'm too good for you, in the deep male voice of her father or boyfriend. A girl like this was not single, and she almost certainly dated someone with a job. That was the thing that annoyed me the most about pretty girls back then, but still, somewhere in the back of my mind, I wished I deserved a girl like that. I never really had a dream or vision of the perfect life for myself before, but now, suddenly I did. It was me figuring out how to be the kind of guy that went out with someone like her. When she left the store, I noticed she was going in the same direction I was going to go in, so naturally I walked after her. I mean, not after her, just in the same direction. By coincidence. After a few blocks, she turned left. I don't usually turn left for another block, but it was such a beautiful spring day, and I was a teenage boy mesmerized by a young lady in a tight skirt walking home from work. There was a much lower likelihood of having such an exquisite view on the next block as on this one. Anyway, she made an odd choice at the end of the street, turning right instead of going left or forward. On the right over there is just a lot, leading to trees that lead into the natural area. Why would she be going there? I stood and watched her. I was confused. She entered into some trees and it dawned on me that I knew a shortcut past the trees into the clearing. I ran so that I could reach the meadow before she did. Maybe in there I could get up the courage to talk to her. I reached my destination and tried to pant quietly, catching my breath and trying to look cool in case the girl walked by. I saw no one there. Peeking out from behind a tree and looking to my right in the direction I would expect her to emerge from the woods, I saw nothing. Then, quietly, I heard branches breaking. She was coming. Adrenaline flowed through me, and I decided to go for it. I would walk casually in her direction and casually strike up a casual conversation. Casually. As I rounded the patch of trees, I could hear her on the other side of. I saw something I did not expect to see. It was not the pretty girl with the perfect makeup and cute outfit I had seen go into the woods. It was a haint. It was a booger. It was a giant monster. 
It was like a demon dog, but it stood on its hind legs like the devil and had claws like some kind of giant hairy lizard, if such a thing could exist. Its ears and nose were like a dog or a wolf, but a primitive caveman kind of wolf with ridiculously long teeth. Its eyes looked like those of an insane thing, like it was terrified or furious, and I couldn't tell which. It looked like it was overwhelmed and horrified as it saw me there, no longer looking so casual. I'm pretty sure I screamed like a girl, and I know. I ran out of there back toward the bus I should have already taken back home. I was crying. What a Casanova. The thing lumbered after me, swishing through bushes and cracking down trees moving like the wind itself. When it would land, it would cause the ground to vibrate so hard that my feet would bounce off the ground. I was weeping. It was going to catch up to me, and whatever happened next was not going to be any fun at all. When I got free of the trees, I could see the bus heading towards its stop. I kept running at top speed. I might be able to make it. I raced frantically wide-eyed toward the road. Behind me, the monster thing roared. It felt like someone had kicked me in the back. The world looked like I was seeing it through jello, and it all vibrated with every footstep I took and every footstep the monster behind me took. I reached the road and never saw the car to my left heading right toward me. I heard it beeping, but it was too late. I was committed to crossing that road and catching that bus. If I didn't, I was dead anyway. So I ignored the impending death, represented by the speeding car to my left, and continued running across the street. I felt the wind and heard the screech behind me. Then I heard the impact as the car met Dogman. Fortunately, the bus driver noticed none of this. I boarded, he drove off, and I took a seat watching the car accident I had inadvertently helped cause as we rolled out of there. The people in the car seemed okay, which was a huge relief. Unfortunately, I saw the dogman, who also was still alive. And it was looking right at me. The creature started jogging after us, and I prayed for the driver to speed up. I prayed there would be nobody at the next stop and that we wouldn't pull over or open the doors until I was home. I looked back at the werewolf thing. It dropped to all fours and was now running, much faster. In fact, it caught up with the bus, looked at me up in my window. I was crying looking back at it. I wondered what it would do. Then it surprised me by turning off into the woods and running away. It was gone. I felt the hugest sense of relief I think I had yet felt in my young life up to that point. I couldn't think of any way to defeat this creature. Then it just got bored of chasing me and it was like, problem solved. Life could be good sometimes. So then, I looked forward and to the right down the road. There, at the next bus stop, sitting there wearing the same cute outfit and the same sweet makeup and same everything was that girl. The girl I had seen walking into the woods. At first I was glad to see her, but then I realized there was no way she could have gotten to that stop from where I last saw her in that amount of time. Unless... So, as she got on the front of the bus, I exited from the rear door. I knew a shortcut from this stop back to my neighborhood. She would be on that bus for at least four or five minutes before she reached the next stop. So I had a head start. I knew she was the werewolf. She was the dogman. She knew I knew, and so now she would stalk me. I got home safely that day, 
but I became increasingly paranoid about going out and even more about coming home. I got to be like the Will Smith character in I Am Legend, wanting to get home before dark and not seen by that... whatever it was. It forced me to get serious about things, and I decided to go away to college. It's not the reason I told my parents that I wanted to attend school in a different state, but it's the real behind-the-scenes reason. I just don't ever want to run into that girl ever again. And I hope that from now till the day I die, that I never see a dog man ever again. Do you have a scary story you want us to read on the show? Just call our voicemail hotline, 804 Le Scary. That's 804 537 2279. And now for something completely scary. Werewolf of the Cemetery. My family recently bought a house in a quaint town in upstate New York. We were told that we were also buying this small graveyard that was directly connected to our property. Even though the cemetery technically belonged to us, we still had to keep it open to the public during daylight hours. The most recent burial in that yard occurred in 1859, so we never got surviving relatives visiting. About the only visitor I ever remember seeing among the gravestones was the strange old werewolf I would see there in the middle of the night. I say old because this long-haired beast had gray among his darker fur. Not white, but silver. He was not albino, he was just aging. I call him a werewolf because that comes closest to describing his appearance. Although I never saw any movie or illustrated werewolf that looked anything like this creature. I would see this thing in the middle of the night as I would get up to use the restroom. One of my bedroom windows overlooked the graveyard and sometimes this figure would be standing there, staring up in the sky. The most recent time I saw him was at the end of February and I think that night that he was staring at the moon. I've never heard the animal make a sound. I said before that this whatever it was didn't resemble anything I'd ever seen before, whether in reality or fiction. I'd attempt to describe it, but I'm not sure how clear I can be in this case. I would say that this was a very large and extremely deformed man, except that its tall ears on top of its head were purely formed. They pointed in different directions, constantly moving, and hearing things my human ears would never hear. Most times when I see him, the ears are the only part of him that's moving, except maybe his fur blowing in the late night breeze. Underneath the lovely tall dog ears on top of its head, there's nothing but nightmare. This is the face of a monster. This thing has thick, heavy eyebrows, a unibrow really, and these thick, shaggy brows hang down low over two furious looking eyeballs. It has a nose more like a dog than like an ape, but its lips under the nose were not split like the upper lip of a dog or a cat. It looks like the mouth of an ape under the nose of a dog. I do not know what its teeth are like, as I've never seen it open its mouth. Another odd thing about this is that I have never seen the monster arrive, and I have never seen it leave. I have not heard of anyone else seeing the thing, even though two other houses are positioned so that they could possibly get views of the location in question. There are only two entrances to the small cemetery, and the chain link fence which completely surrounds it. One gate is on the street and usually kept open. The other is on my property, allowing one to go from our backyard to the cemetery. The fence is at least five feet tall all the way around, and the brick wall behind it must be at least seven feet tall. There is some forest past the house behind the brick wall, but it's not like this monster could have wandered from the woods into the graveyard. If I was witnessing a natural animal, then I have no real explanation of how it could have arrived there, or where it could have come from. This leads me to consider two possibilities. 
One is that I might be experiencing hypnagogic hallucinations of this creature. In other words, it might not be down in the cemetery at all, but might be only in my head. Maybe I'm projecting the image or idea of the werewolf down there into the graveyard. The other possibility that pops into my mind is that maybe the creature is not natural, but rather some form of apparition tied to that location in some way we cannot understand. In any case, I see a hairy, tall, mutated looking man who looks like he's half dog standing in the cemetery beneath my bedroom window at night, and it terrifies me. Update. As I was proofreading this to send to you, my neighbor sent me a bit of news I had previously been unaware of. I had been wondering why this cemetery was not adjacent to any church. It seemed so odd for it to be on private ground, especially as we are not in a rural area, but a suburban one. I must have made a comment to that effect to her in an email, and she just wrote me back that the church used to be located where my house currently stands. It seems the church burned down and nobody alive claimed relation to any of the people buried in the yard. The town finally allowed a man to build his residence on the old church property if he took on the responsibility of the cemetery's upkeep. This is why we inherited this obligation. Now that I know that our house is on what was once considered holy ground, I feel more certain that the visions I had of the dogman must have been paranormal in nature. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the dogman I've been seeing is of an evil or demonic nature. Maybe he's here in a loyal way. Maybe he's the guardian of the graveyard. The ancient Egyptians depicted the guardian of the land of the dead as Anubis, who was shown as a man with a dog's head. I was taught in school that this was meant as metaphor. Maybe it was that. And maybe it was something more literal at the same time. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to say that if you have a scary story you'd like to tell us here, you can write Peter at PeterBernard.com or you can call our new Scary Stories hotline number and leave it to us in the form of a voicemail message. It's easy to remember. 804-LESCARY. That's 804-L-E-S-C-A-R-Y or... 804-537-2279 The Werewolf of Untermeyer Park I'm sure you've heard of Untermeyer Park. It's haunted. It's used for ceremonies by cults. There have been reports of sightings of demons in Sasquatch. And every single time I went there when I was a teenager, I would see an upright walking dog-headed man. For my friends and me, going to Untermeyer Park was always an adventure, and always a dare. We had heard friend of a friend stories about people dying there, and we took them very seriously. We all felt that each time we got in my cousin's car and headed out to Untermeyer, it might be our last time ever. One time when we were there, we saw a tall man with a top hat walk past us as though he were in a trance. Some of us giggled, but he never turned to look at us. Almost every trip to the park since then, my friends would call out that they were seeing the top hat man. I would ask where, but I never saw him again. And it was sort of the opposite thing with the dog man or werewolf. When I would see him, I would sense that it was time to go, and I would insist to the others that we leave. As far as I know, none of the others would ever see the dog man, but none of them ever argued with me that he was there. We all believed what the other would say in Untermeyer Park because it seemed like basically anything could happen there. In fact, now that I think about it, the first time I ever told my friends that I had been seeing the dog man was when I told that boss character. I don't know who he was, but one night when we were sitting in the park after dark, a black car pulled up out of nowhere. We didn't have time to run away, and we should have. We should have seen and heard that car approaching for at least 30 seconds. Instead, somehow, we noticed this car pulling to a stop, and an old dude in a suit got out and walked directly up to me. He started quizzing me if I've seen the lupine something or the lupus majoris or some crap. I can't remember anymore. I said no, 
but we seen gross and we seen a werewolf. He quizzed me about the werewolf and I gave him the description. All the while my friends were completely weirded out by this because they had never seen it and didn't know I had. After I gave the guy the description, he left. No, wait, he told me that I didn't see the werewolf and then he got in his car. I mean, like, he warned me I better act like I hadn't seen it. I don't remember if he drove off in a normal way or vanished or what because my friends were freaking out and asking me about the dog man. So, okay, here is what I would see on those nights. I would look into the woods on occasion to check for lights. The lights usually meant a bonfire or people with lit torches, in other words, cultists. All sorts of weird ceremonies were performed in those woods in those days. I'm glad that's all I know about that. So, anyway, I would be checking for lights, and then I'd see this face looking out at me from the forest, from between the trees. It was some kind of animal face, like a bear, but not a bear. The first night I ever saw him, he stepped out from the trees and I saw him in his entirety. He was taller than a man and more muscular too. His hands ended in long claws, almost like the talons of a giant eagle. It had massive, thick legs, and yet it was a dog of some kind, a massive, terrifying-looking dog that walked around on its hind legs for some reason. That first night I saw the dog thing, I heard a voice in my head. It asked, Do you see me? I nodded my head, yes. The voice in my head resumed. It said, If you see me, then run. And so, since then, when I see a dog man, I run. Some of my beast friends are dog men. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I live in Wisconsin, and I know where to find dogmen anytime I want to. I'm not going to give out the location, but if I think you're cool, I'll take you there. I'm also not going to give out my name, though. This kind of dogman is the kind that Linda Godfrey used to write about. They don't have hands or thumbs or whatever. They're not werewolves. They are large dogs, as tall as me when they sit down or are on all fours, and taller than me when they stand up, usually. They can walk on their hind legs like people, and when they do so, they tend to hold their front paws together as though they were praying or begging. Most of them look like wolves or German shepherds, but there are other kinds of equally large dogmen that run with them sometimes when I see them in a pack. They have white ones with black patches they have ones with floppy ears that look like sheepdogs. They don't all look like wolves. And of course they don't always run in packs, although I'm not certain why. I've seen the same dog show up in one pack and then show up solo and then with a different pack. I think it's just like musicians breaking up bands and forming new bands. But I'm only guessing. I've never been privy to a conversation between the dogmen, except for the few conversations I've been directly involved in. I actually met the dogman by accident on one of my first photo shoots when I was a teenager. This was back during the MySpace era. I can't remember the photographer's name. He would still have some pictures of the dogman if that photographer is still alive somewhere. So he was shooting me and then the dogs surrounded me and he kept shooting. I don't know if he ever showed those pictures publicly or not, but I remember him taking the shots. I came back to that location literally the next day with another friend of mine, and we bought sliced ham at the supermarket to bring with us for the dogmen. The main one I had met the day before showed up again that second day. He seems to be the friendliest both with humans and with others of his own kind, and I've seen him the most often. Imagine a wolf with a sort of speckled coat and extra long legs, and then you'd be seeing him in your mind's eye. Now, I said they were mostly taller than I am when they stand up on their hind legs, but just like us humans, they have taller ones and shorter ones among their people. For about five years, another model and myself rented a house in the area where these dogmen live in the Midwest. The dogmen would come to visit us at home. 
usually announcing their presence by walking around loudly on our roof in the middle of the night and waking us up. I have to say, the first time that happened, we were both pretty frightened, as we had no idea what was going on. When we put on our robes and went outside into the cold, dark night, only to see these big dogs up on our roof, standing up on their hind legs, staring back at us down on the ground with those glowing eyes. The two of us burst out laughing. We had thought it was a burglar, but it was only a group of big, fear old dogmen. We went back inside, and we went back to sleep. Now, I had a boyfriend during that period who made a big deal out of the dogmen. He kept telling us that cryptids were dangerous and evil and blah, blah, blah. Maybe they were dangerous to him, you know? Maybe they chased him. Maybe they bit the seed out of his genes, but they didn't do that to me. I hardly ever wear denim anyway. It's just not really my style. I resented him trying to drive a wedge between us girls and these sweet carnivore monsters that we had made friends with. It's like this guy had become too controlling. Or else maybe the dogmen changed me in some way. Maybe because of them, I value my freedom more. A few of our mailmen almost got injured because of the dogmen, so I admit that they were not always angels. The thing is, I don't think they realized their own strength. They only meant it as play. The dogman can't be blamed that the government hires such fragile people to deliver the mail. They should hire someone who knows how to take a joke. Know what I mean? So one of the guys I was seeing had this idea to shoot video of the dogman and make a million dollars. I wanted to break up with him just because of that. But my housemate felt like that wouldn't stop him from coming back and taking pictures or video of the dogman anyway without my permission. So what we decided to do was this. We told the dogman what the guy was thinking. Then we told the dogman where the guy lived. After that, the problem just seemed to take care of itself and disappear. That's another thing about the dogman. I don't know if they understand what strangers tell them, but they've always understood me. I don't know if it's the words I speak or the ideas I'm thinking about or what, but they never have the slightest, they never have the slightest bit of trouble understanding me. They are also, like most dogs, very loyal and eager to help out whenever anyone starts to give me trouble or to threaten trouble for them. We all work together as a team. We have each other's back, as they say. So I'm back in the city now doing other kinds of work from what I used to do when I was younger, but I still meet up with my former housemate, and we still return to Dogman Land, as we call it, that part of Wisconsin that I'm not going to name by name. You can find it by yourself, though. It's not as far off the beaten track as you'd think. After all, the first time I was there, I was wearing heels for my photo shoot, right? And these creatures are not as dangerous as people will tell you. I mean, if, if you're a woman, they aren't so dangerous. I don't think they care for men. But if you're a female, then don't let their reputation frighten you away. Just be kind to them. And remember to bring some other kind of meat to give them. Besides the meat on your own bones, you might still need some of that for yourself. I named four different dogmen who were my favorites. And I have plenty of stories about them. I can share the stories with you if you think anyone would find them interesting, but I'm telling you right up front, these are cute friends of mine. These are not killers. As a result, the stories might not be as scary as some of your others. At any rate, let me know. I've got plenty of anecdotes I can share. After all, <coughs> some of my beast friends are dogmen. Who's the one who always can? Why only Kathy Barrickman. Please join us in thanking tonight's executive producer, Kathy Barrickman, for making this entire special possible. Kathy is a channel member, and she also made us a nice donation yesterday using our super thanks button located under each of our YouTube videos. I hope Kathy knows she doesn't need to do that. We thank her in each and every show that we do anyway. But this is tax season, and we have to pay more taxes this year than we paid last year, even though we made more money last year. 
We aren't in a position to turn down Kathy's generosity. Thank you, Kathy. You're an important part of this channel. And if any of the rest of you would like to help this channel stay alive, Henry Lee Dogman will be along at the very end of the show to explain all the deets on that. In the meantime, let's jump into our second of five Dogman stories of the day. And this one is called... Dogman. Chaos Agent on the Road. Dear Scary Stories NYC. I have a true story that happened to me personally about the Dogman and about the first and so far only night that I've ever spent in jail. What does Dogman have to do with me going to a local lockup? We'll settle in, because the answer to that takes a little while to tell. At that time, I was eking out a living as a stage magician. It was nighttime after my final gig at a particular venue, and I was driving from the casino I had been appearing at toward the Berry Creek Cabins in Washington Parish, Louisiana, where I intended to stay the night. I never got there, so this story really has nothing to do with that place. I was very much looking forward to spending the night in one of their cabins before moving on. However, the dogman decided I should spend the night in jail. So I'm looking at Google Maps and trying to remember what road I was driving on when the dogman ran out in front of me. This was a long time back, more than 10 years, and the street view images were all taken during the day, so I'm just not sure. I'm thinking it was Louisiana Route 16 here where it happened. I remember it only being two lanes, and I remember it being very dark, and that the woods were on both sides, closing in, and kind of making me feel a little paranoid. I've had a nightmare since the night after my first driving lesson that a monster would jump out in front of my car at night. And then, that is specifically what happened there. I was driving too close to the right, maybe, but that road feels too narrow to ride on, or at least it did to me that night. When the figure jumped out, I thought it was a big teenager pulling a prank in a costume, and all time stood still. I felt sick to my stomach instantly for a few different reasons at once. Yes, it looked like my nightmare, that's very true. But since I didn't actually believe in monsters at that time, the only thing I thought it could be was someone in a costume pulling a prank. I was going to slam right into them, and I was panicking. But I felt even sicker, because a part of my mind was nagging at me, saying, there was no way that could be a person in a costume. That fur covered that body in just the same way that an animal's fur does. It wasn't all frizzy and phony looking, the way that most gorilla costumes I've seen look. And that's another thing. It wasn't a gorilla. I mean to say that if this was someone pulling a prank, they were not pretending to be a Sasquatch. This monster had some kind of a long-snouted face. Not like a baboon, or not like any kind of ape. It was much more like a dog head. Like some sort of wolf-headed Bigfoot monster in Louisiana. Continuing to stay paused at that moment in the story, I would like to point out that I did not know about the Rougarou, or the Lougarou, the two French-American kinds of werewolves. I had no context to understand what I was seeing. As you'll see later in the story, this was an intelligent creature, so maybe it was a werewolf or a shape-shifting shaman, and not actually a dogman. It looked the same way the entire time I saw it, I did not witness a transformation, but I wouldn't be surprised if that thing really were some kind of evil wizard, as bizarre as that looks after I type it. I am trained in stage magic, and I had also been heavily indoctrinated as a materialist, so it pains me to admit that I think that some kind of technology sufficiently enough advanced for me to call real magic was involved here. Whether you agree with me about that or not, I think you'll understand why I feel that way in a little while. The size of this thing was not out of the range of human size, although it would have to have been a really big guy if this was a costume. Well over six feet tall, but we're not talking seven feet. It was a muscular and wide guy who was not a tall basketball player physique, much more of an NFL linebacker or something like that. 
only wearing fur instead of clothing, and with a dog head in place of a helmet. Let's say a wolf head, really. A very primitive kind of dog, feral-looking. I swerved to the left, trying to avoid hitting whoever or whatever that was. I didn't see until I was already in the other lane that there was a car driving with its lights out, heading directly toward me. To be clear, I don't mean that he didn't have his high beams on. I mean, this car was dark, like some kind of ghost car. So I swerved even further left, and the car spun out as that guy sideswiped me from behind. That stopped my momentum in one direction and slowed me down a lot. As both cars came to halts, the guy in the other car came out glaring, calling me all sorts of names. I looked around for that kid in the monster costume, and I couldn't see him anywhere. I told the driver about the pedestrian. He had to have seen him. There was no way he didn't. Nevertheless, he denied it. I then pointed out that he himself had been driving at night with his lights off. He called me a liar, and I started to wonder about this guy's sanity. I was looking right at the car he sideswiped me in, and those headlights were still off. I pointed this out to him, and he called me a liar again, then marched to his car, reached inside, and turned on his high beams, blinding me for a moment. Then I heard him having a one-way conversation, and I walked out of the bright light to see that he was talking to someone on a car radio kind of a thing, like the kind that cops use. In fact, I thought I heard him using cop terminology, too. And he was freaking me out. Maybe this guy was even crazier than I thought. When he finished talking on his device, he reached in the car and hung it up. Then announced to me that his brother-in-law was on the way. That kind of scared me. Because I didn't know what the hell I was supposed to mean. The guy laughed at my expression and informed me that his brother-in-law was a cop. Well, that didn't make me feel any better, believe me. I heard it sound like someone laughing at me, and I looked around. It was coming from the woods. I asked the other guy if he heard that, and he acted like he didn't. How could he not have heard that? And then that creature walked out from the woods just enough that the moon and the ambient lighting revealed him clearly. He could not have been a human. His legs were all different. They were more like deer legs than human. Then I saw it take a step to the side, and it was obvious to me that those were dog legs. Of course they were. Still, the way it stood there looked so impossible, even as it looked so natural. Again, that laughing sound came, but this time I could see where it was coming from. That hellish-looking dog beast, with demonic, glowing eyes, standing like a man, but with long, clawed monster hands. It looked just like the thing I had dreamed of for years. But something like that couldn't exist in the real world, could it? I pointed it out to the other guy, but he wouldn't look where I was pointing. Instead, he came closer and stared at my face, quizzically, as he asked me what I thought I was seeing. When I described for him that evil, glowing-eyed, Upright standing devil dog. The guy's face relaxed and he laughed coldly. Oh, so you're gonna try to blame the Rougarou for your bad driving? I got news for you, pal. I don't believe in the Rougarou. Okay, I had no idea what he was talking about, and he refused to look at the werewolf dogman creature. Sirens approached, and the dogman receded to the shadows of the forest. Two officers got out of the cop car. Then I watched as both walked right past me and exchanged strange handshakes with the guy who rammed into me. The three of them spoke quietly together as I approached them. One of the cops swirled and grabbed me by the wrist, somehow spinning me around and slamming my face into the hood of his car. Then he asked the other guy to explain how I had hit into him which was not what happened. Occasionally, I would get asked a question, 
Then my arm would get twisted further when I gave an answer they didn't like. This went on for quite some time before the other cops suddenly noticed that all four of the cop car's tires had somehow been slashed while we had been conversing with my face on the hood. Going through my belongings, they brilliantly ascertained that I was a stage magician. Immediately, they arrested me for slashing the wheels on their cop car. I asked them how I could have done that while they had my arm twisted behind my back. The guy answered me, I don't know, Houdini. I'm not the stage magician, am I? As they handcuffed me, I saw the dogman in the woods laughing at me being led away. I told the cops that he was right there, but they just read me my rights and laughed at me right along with the dogman. I had to sit in the back seat with my cuffs too tight for even Houdini to escape for over two hours, waiting for a tow truck that I eventually had to pay for. In jail, we got bologna on white bread and I think the meat was spoiled. It was one of those nights that you wish you could forget, but you know you never will. Why did that dogman or Rougarou choose me to mess up the night of? Was it a random choice? If I had taken a different road, would he have done this to someone else? Or would he have just come and got me on that other road instead? Was it personal? Or did it just happen because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time? In either case, that dogman did it deliberately. He wanted to do something evil to somebody. He wanted to make the world a worse place. That creature wrecked my life just because he could. He thought it was funny. And now you should understand why I call him. <laughs> Chaos Agent on the Road. Dogman made me chase him. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a story about a dogman who stands tall and has a broad chest. He's technically a monster, but that's nothing we can't get past in my opinion. This creature is capable of being a man-eater, but I don't believe he chooses to dine on creatures of our species. That doesn't mean he's safe to be around, though. Unless you're me, it seems. The Dugman isn't exactly tame around me. It's more that he seems to openly disapprove of me. That doesn't result in him attacking or harassing me. Quite the contrary. When he sees me coming, he gets up and leaves. He avoids me. And this has forced me to put off much of the rest of my life in my attempts to see him again. And again. He was the first man I ever met who didn't fall on his knees in front of me in love. And so I just couldn't get him off my mind. And the worst part is that if he really is a dogman and not a werewolf or a shapeshifter, then there really may never be any chance for a future between us. I'm a young woman of means and I believe it is emotionally healthy that I am used to having my way. My father told me that I deserve only the best of everything, and who am I to argue with the man? This is why I found myself obsessed when I met this creature who was not impressed with me in any way. That had never happened before, as I am quite impressive. I am aware that youth is fleeting, and that beauty is only skin deep, but right now I am still young, and my skin is deep, yo. People see me who aren't even attracted to girls, and inside of 10 minutes, they're trying to chat me up. I'm just very charismatic, and even dogs and kids love me. But that dog man I met, he acted like I was just the same as anyone else. Now, I'm not saying he stalked me. I mean, that's kind of the problem. He didn't. He showed little to no interest in me at all. This was not a scary kind of a dog man but I certainly can't call him a nice one either because he really did treat me in a somewhat inconsiderate manner. Most people who have a dogman sighting know that they are unlikely to ever see that dogman again. Heck, they're unlikely to see any dogman ever again. Those people, however, they are not me. 
So what happened was that I was out with a boy I met online, and we were walking through the grounds behind one of my family's homes as the sun was setting. It was a pretty romantic scene, but then the guy started pointing and crying like a baby. I looked to where he was pointing, and there was a big dog over there. I was like, so what? It's a dog, Nancy. Then the guy screams like he's in a Godzilla movie and starts running back to the house. I looked over to where the dog was, and I swear that animal was standing up like he was a giant meerkat. It was absolutely the sweetest thing, but I can kind of understand the boy being a tad on the frightened side. The dog must have been as tall as a bear when he stood up like that. Still, he was unbearably cute, get it? So I got on the phone and had the family staff turn the electric fence on around those woods. I think my grandfather had that put in to keep dangerous animals out, but when he passed on, someone decided to turn the fence off to save on electrical expenses. Once the fence was turned on, I felt reasonably certain that the dogman was trapped on the land. I then had one of our people purchase a lot of cheap raw meat, and I set out to make friends with that fear old dog man. It was never hard to find him as there was only one shelter out back there. I could always find him in this small natural cave and I could always get him out of that cave by laying some of that nasty meat down on the ground. Now this is about the most beautiful animal I've ever seen. Besides the person that lives in my mirror, naturally, his fur is perfect. His face always has a benign expression on it. I bet his fur is super soft, but he's never let me pet it. I tried leaving meat out in a trail leading to a nice tree that I enjoy sitting under. I thought perhaps we could spend some time together once he was done eating. However, when he finished gnawing on his bones, he simply walked away without even looking at me. I had to use a lot of hand sanitizer to get that nasty meat blech off my hands. And I had to do it alone under that tree. Other girls actually fear the dogman. In my case, I know for an absolute fact that the dogman wouldn't take a bite out of me if I asked him to. I finally got so frustrated that I decided I would skip a day of feeding the dogman just to teach him a lesson. With the electric fence up, there was no food for him, except for what I gave him. He couldn't escape to hunt. I had outsmarted him, and I was going to break his will, yet. I would make him mine somehow. I was certain of it. But the next morning began with a cousin of mine screeching that something had eaten her poodle. I found all her shouting incredibly annoying. But after I had a sip of coffee, I began to wonder if it had been my dogman who had eaten her little monster. I didn't teach him a lesson at all. He taught me a lesson instead. Still, the only other pets on the grounds were goldfish. So I decided to double down on starving out that dogman. The next morning I awoke to find that someone had turned the electric fence off and the dogman had escaped. I had to fire someone to get the others to tell me who turned that fence off. It turned out it was the head groundskeeper and he refused to apologize. He told me that I should be apologizing for trapping that dangerous carnivore on the grounds of the family home. He lectured me that the beast would have eaten a human next and that it would have been all my fault. Obviously, he had no right to speak to me that way. I couldn't believe the gall of this man. In fact, no other man had ever treated me that way before. Other than the dog man. And I'm not sure if he counts as a man. The head groundskeeper counts as one, though. Believe me, he might count for one and a half or two. So I'm kind of over the dog man for now, but I have a new crush in the form of the groundskeeper. He likes me even less than the dog man did, and so I find it hard to stop thinking about him. Everybody else likes me, except this dumb groundskeeper who thinks he's such a big shot. I haven't been this insulted since. Dogman forced me.
to chase him. We got a new member. Well, I'll be. It's Long Island Bigfoot, L.I.B. Please join me in thanking today's executive producer, Long Island Bigfoot. Lots of people have heard that Bigfoot is in Whitehall in upstate New York. But how many people know about Bigfoot out on the island? Only people like me, who subscribe to Long Island Bigfoot, one of the best East Coast Sasquatch channels on all of YouTube. Now Long Island Bigfoot has kindly sent us a super chat and joined our channel memberships. Thanks, LIB. You're the best. In exchange, he gets to see our weekly Sunday secret uncensored Dogman stories. Dogman from the Dog Star. Space Brother or Existential Threat? Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a dogman story for you, but this is about an intelligent breed of dogman. I don't know if it's the same breed as the ones you talk about on your channel. Uh, My daddy felt they were from outer space. In fact, he just presumed that they were from Sirius the Dog Star. That was the way my daddy was. He saw a dog-headed, upright, walking humanoid covered in fur in the proximity of what appeared to him to be some kind of flying saucer. Why, that meant that he was being visited by someone from the Dog Star. I once questioned his logic on this subject, and he asked me in a surly way, Why do you think they call it the Dog Star, son, if that's not where the Dogman come from? Like, he thought I was dim-witted for even questioning his leap of logic. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean I think he's wrong. I don't know if he was right or wrong. But I do know that I got to see the being in question myself, only years after the fact. I'm going to give you a full description of what I witnessed, and compare it to my father's descriptions and clarifications as well. Daddy's story changed from the one he told me when I was young, to the version he told me when I was a man. And I'll get into explaining the whys and wherefores of all that as well. My father was always what you might call controversial. When I was a kid, my mom took me away from my daddy. We went to live in the city with her various boyfriends and whatnot. When I was 30, about 15 years back, I was surprised to be contacted by my daddy out of the blue via a social media messenger service. I don't even remember how he found me. But I had never been able to find him online before, and I had no idea where he was living in the real world either. My mother had either lost contact with him, or else refused for some other reason, to let me know Dad's whereabouts, so I didn't even know if he was here or in the next world. Anyway, it turned out my daddy was still living in the same home he was in when Mom took me away from him. It seemed he was reaching out to me because he knew he was not long for this world. Daddy's health was deteriorating, and he was in and out of the hospital. It had advanced to the point where he was forced into looking and moving into a hospice to get better care around the clock. He wanted me to come out to his home, check it out, and see if I wanted to keep it for myself. If I didn't, he asked if I could handle selling it for him once he was being cared for. I wasn't sure if I wanted to own the place, but I knew I wanted to visit it and my father while I still could. I had missed both him and that place. Most of my dreams always happened in that house or backyard or the woods beyond. I might have moved away physically, but that remained the home of my imagination, and I had never really expected to have the chance to see it with my own real eyes again. The chance to get to know my father again before his passing felt even larger than that for me. There was a feeling that maybe the weird hole I felt inside my life could be filled in somehow and maybe healed. We did have a warm reunion, but almost as soon as I got there, it seemed my daddy's health regressed. He had a good eight to ten hours when I first got there, then he sort of hit the wall. I found myself running the house as he moved into the hospice, both far sooner than originally planned. It felt strange living in that home that I hadn't been in since I was a child. Then visiting my father each day to tell him what time the squirrels got the dog barking and to show him photos of the sunrise so he could then use his magic powers to predict the day's weather for me through to the next dawn. It was amazing to in many ways pick up our friendship 
right from where we had left it when I'd been quite small, and yet to have it be an adult version of the way we used to get along. The fondness and mutual admiration was still there, but now he was the one dependent in many ways on me. No longer having to concern myself with rent, I realized that my paltry revenue streams were suddenly more than enough to buy me food and gas to get around. I figured I'd get back to the rat race in a second, but I could afford to take some time off and sort of re-examine my life before charging off on the next panicked adventure. I felt I could afford to make a decision as an adult for once and not a starving chicken with its head cut off. So I took to walking in the back of the property in the early mornings and again in the afternoons when I got back from visiting my daddy. One warm evening I even fell asleep under a tree and woke up to see a bright light in front of me, momentarily blinding me. I thought it must be dawn, but I think my watch said something like 10 p.m. I wondered if the watch had stopped. It was an old school wind-up kind. But then the bright blinding sun in front of me moved laterally, left to right, which is something the sun isn't usually supposed to do. It then dimmed to reveal itself to be something far smaller and closer to me than the sun. I wasn't sure what I was seeing, so I was very disoriented, as you can imagine. I stood up, and I swear it looked like a UFO from some reimagined modern horror director, like Del Toro or something. What I mean is it wasn't a symmetrical vehicle. It wasn't just a flying saucer. For that reason, I find it impossible to remember how it looked well enough to draw for people what I saw. It wasn't a real shape that a ship could possibly be. It wasn't sleek or aerodynamic at all. So it felt very dreamlike. I wonder if that's what it was, a dream, and if I was in fact asleep and just imagining all of this. There was what I took to be an astronaut walking around the field between me and the craft. The uh, astronaut appeared to be scouring the ground for something and I imagined it was looking for earth rocks like our astronauts looked for moon rocks on that TV show about going to the moon in the early 70s or whatever it was. As it passed in front of me in the distance, I went from thinking it was wearing a fur-covered astronaut outfit with an oddly shaped helmet to thinking I was seeing a muscular and furry humanoid canine of some sort. It was a dogman. But was it a dogman from this world? Or was this one of those dogmen from the dog planet that my father told me about as a kid? I tried to stand up just to see if I could or if this was a dream. It was really happening all right. I could stand and I could walk, retreating from the scene quietly to avoid being noticed by the dog-headed astronaut. I beat it back to my father's house. Once inside, I called him on the phone asking him about that dogman and the strange flying craft. He didn't sound happy that I woke him up to ask him about that kind of stuff, and he demanded I explain to him immediately what had just happened. I started to try to describe the oddly shaped flying craft and how bright it had been. And my daddy cut me off. He told me to bring the dog inside right away, lock the doors and windows, and pull the drapes. Then he told me to stay inside and not look out until after dawn. And then he told me the most important thing of all for me to do in that night between then and the sunrise was to make absolutely certain that in no way, for no reason, should I in any case ever even consider calling him back up and ruining his beauty rest before 10 a.m. the following morning. Then he slammed the receiver down and I went around doing the things my daddy had told me to do. That night I had the strangest dreams, mixing parts of what I had seen with stories my daddy told me when I was a kid. You see, back then I didn't really believe when he would talk about the dogman, because my mom told me that my daddy was crazy when he talked about the dogman. I remember he told me that when he saw the creature, he would go to meet him in the woods, and he would barter and trade with him. I asked him what he would trade, and back then he told me that I didn't need to know that part. I just needed to know that this was business for adults and never for kids and that he was always looking out for me when he cut deals 
with the alien dogman from the serious dog star. I believe dad's belief system got entered into the records as part of my parents' divorce proceedings, so it's practically a formal religion, or at least a formally declared perspective and worldview. That night I dreamed that it was my turn to deal with the dogman in those woods. My turn to find something that he valued, to barter with him. The dreams turned to nightmares with hellish imagery, and I found it hard to get back to sleep. I kept waking up, certain that I'd heard something scratching outside the window. I wanted to look, but I remembered my daddy's warning, and then I didn't. The next day, I went to the hospice, and my father was very unhappy with me. I thought I told you that dog man was none of your business, he snapped at me. I responded, look, it was none of my business when I was a kid. Now you've put me in charge of that land, which means you've decided to make me the one to deal with the dog man. He was taken aback as he realized I was right. He hadn't thought of that before putting me in charge. After a moment, Daddy looked angry again and told me, stay away from that dog man. But I wasn't going to take that from him. I was a grown man and it was time for me to know exactly what my father had bartered and what I would be expected to do to carry on the tradition. Although my daddy knew I was right, the realization was overwhelming for him. The old man began to weep silently, his face twisted and his shoulders heaving. A doctor forcefully asked me to clear out. My father waved him away, ignoring my daddy's wishes and orderly escorted me out of the building, and my father was sedated and removed from the general area. Well, gee, that went well. Now I knew even less what I should do, and I was not in a very good mood about any of this. That night, I got back to the house around sunset, and I could hear canines of some sort howling and yapping in the woods behind the house. I couldn't just drive off and abandon my father, but I swear I did not want to spend even one more night in that place. I just got Daddy's dog and a bunch of dog food, packed them all in the car, and decided to drive to my cousin Milo's place, where he had told me I was always invited to hang out. As we were driving off into the night, my phone started ringing. I saw it was a call from the hospice, so I picked up. Turns out it was my father. He told me, Son, pack the dog in the car. I told him I already had. He told me to bring a bunch of dog food with me and to head over to my cousin Milo's place. I told him, great minds think alike, Daddy. He sounded relieved and asked me to put my cousin on the phone for a second. I said, no, Daddy, I'm not there yet. And I described to him exactly where I was driving on that dark two-lane highway heading out to see that same cousin that my father was telling me to go see. I forget what my daddy said next because that was when a really big dark form leaped out onto the road in front of me and I swerved around that humanoid form, sliding sideways off the road and whacking my head on the steering wheel as we came to a sudden halt against a tree. It was the dogman and it had deliberately caused my accident. As my consciousness faded away, I looked over at that strange figure and it seemed to be lit up brightly in strange colors that I wouldn't be able to tell you the names of. It was a monster canine standing on two legs, but it also was a sort of a future being. Its fur seemed to also be a uniform that was lit and glowing in some way that I just couldn't understand. I couldn't tell if he was actually glowing or if I was just banged up and imagining things. And the next thing I knew... A policeman was talking to me and waking me up. Which parts of that had happened before I fell asleep? And which parts had I only dreamed afterward? I know I did see an upright dogman jump out in front of my car. But had I actually seen it glowing? One thing that was real was that I was in a car crash. And it took some time for memory of the event to come back. I remembered the dogman from space... And I told the policeman to watch out. There are dogs from the Dog Star in these woods, I told him. And then I think I passed out again. You know, I was rescued because I had just explained my location to my father seconds before crashing. He knew exactly where to tell the troopers to go look for me. 
Daddy saved my life in a literal fashion. And the next time we spoke on the phone, he told me everything, finally. I didn't really understand what he was saying then, but I remembered it in detail. And it's had more than a decade to sink in since then. The dogman that he described to me in that phone conversation did not sound to me like a spaceman. He was some kind of a creature that I would probably describe as being more like a demon. Although none of this terminology really explains it. The true nature of reality is more complicated than just aliens or demons or angels. Those are words to use to explain things to children. Those are oversimplifications. My father struggled to communicate this to me, even as he himself remained trapped in his notion that he must have been dealing with a space alien, and it must have been from Sirius, because it clearly had a canine head. You could certainly say that, at least in a figurative or metaphoric sense, this definitely was an alien from Sirius the Dog Star. It was so much that, in a mythic sense, that it almost didn't matter if there were any factual nature to the label in any literal sense. But that having been said, according to the conversations I had with my daddy when he called me from the hospice, that dogman was not looking to bring earth rocks home to another planet. He seemed more interested in collecting souls and life stories or essences and bringing those back to some kind of hellish sounding, soulless other reality that he somehow dripped down out of. According to Daddy, I used to have an older brother. Now this is not true. I was the oldest brother and had a younger sister. Daddy said that I was in fact the middle child, but I was the one he loved most. The dogman, the scary spaceman, he told Daddy that I was sickly and I was not going to live into adulthood. The dogman said he could take my older brother's life force and make it so that he had never been born. Then he could take the force that would have been my brother and sort of attach it to my life. Then I could live in my brother's place and not have to pass away young. My father said he agreed to this, and so he explained, This is why my mother and I have no memory of this brother having ever been a part of our lives. But deep down, he thinks my mother knew what he did. Her conscious mind couldn't understand that she had lost a son. But her subconscious, her unconscious, and her body itself mourned the loss of her firstborn. This is why she instinctively took me far away from my father, in spite of the fact that I was his favorite. And this is why I survived into adulthood, and I'm still alive now to write this to you. So this would sound like a happy, if kind of crazy ending, right? Except that my daddy said that the dogman lied to him. Daddy would have dreams where my older brother came to him and showed him the limbo that he had been consigned to for all eternity so that I could live on instead. My father knew that what he had done was wrong and told me that making deals with the dogman was the same as cutting a deal with Satan himself. I reminded Daddy that this dogman didn't seem to want to cut any sorts of bargains at all with me. He just wanted to run me off the road. He just thought it was funny to see me suffer. I wasn't even worthy of approaching to negotiate. Well, Daddy admitted he did not understand that part, but he told me he was relieving me of my duties selling the home. He had already been on the phone with a real estate company, and he said I'd get my share of whatever they were able to get for the place after selling it. I think I did eventually get a few thousand in the end after taxes and fees, and it was almost a year after Daddy's passing before I saw the first cent. Still, the good part was that I didn't have to go back out to the old house anymore. As much as I'd missed that place, that's how little I want to ever have to be out there ever again. You know, it's kind of funny. The guy who bought the house, he's convinced it's haunted. He and I are acquaintances on a social media platform, and he posts ghost stories that happen to him in the house and in the woods behind. He hasn't posted any dogman stories yet, and he hasn't posted any UFO stories either. He has, however, reported strange colored lights flying around the property at night, sometimes going in and out of the house, moving straight through walls and windows. 
I sometimes wonder if this is actually the same phenomenon that we saw expressing itself in a different way for his different nervous system. The current owner doesn't believe in the dogman, you see, and he doesn't believe in demons. He does, however, believe in ghosts, so should we really be surprised that he sees ghosts instead of what my father and I saw? I don't know what that force or intelligence is out there at that house. Maybe its true form is the dogman. Maybe not. Whatever it is, it doesn't feel positive or good. And to me, at least, it feels aberrant and evil, unhealthy and wrong. And so I am left with the same question in my head at the end, which I was asking in the beginning. Namely, Dogman from the Dog Star. Space Brother? Or Existential Threat? Our EP Gale can never fail, winning more than Fraser in the well. When we unveil each new thumbnail, we hope she will avail. Miss Gale, please join me in welcoming Miss Gale to our channel members. They all get to see our weekly Sunday Uncensored Scary Dogman stories, which this week was about Dogman burning down a 420 shack. Gee, what's, what's that mean? I don't know. It's some kind of grown-up term, understood only by our channel members, like Miss Gale. Do I have Sinocephalic Dogmen in my family tree? Dear Scary Stories NYC, I was recently pressed into duty, going through my late great aunt Eleanor's house and attic, figuring out what we should keep, what we should dump, and what we might be able to auction off. One of the items I claim for myself is an old photograph album dating from the early part of the 20th century. It appears to have more recent photos in the front of relatives that I can't identify, but the back third is filled up with unmarked photos that must have been rescued from a much older book or something. I couldn't identify a single person in any of those images. The photos in the back do not appear to be American at all, and we suspect the photos are from the region in Romania where our aunt's maternal side is supposed to have come from. Essentially, her side of the family has Transylvanian blood, though we have no stories of vampires in our history. Since I discovered this photo book, we are now questioning whether we might have descended in part from either werewolf or cynocephalic blood. In other words, we are now wondering if at least some of our family might have some kind of dogman genes in them. What do I mean by that? Well, I really don't know. I'm writing to you hoping that you or someone in your audience might be able to help us sort it out. I mean, it's not like we're alarmed, but we certainly are interested, and we would like to know more. Here is the photo in question which I've restored to some degree using an online AI restoring program. I think I've been able to remove all the creases and signs of age, and I restored it to monochrome black and white, taking out the stains and the yellowing. I do not know who the man is in the photo, but I imagine it was an ancestor of my aunt. The outfits that the men are both wearing, could those have been ordinary dress suits for the day? Or were those two figures maybe employed in show business? I mean, look at those buttons on their vests and coats. Look at the way both are trimmed in fur. Is that a mask being worn by the man on the left to make him look like a dogman? Or is that actually some kind of a canine-headed human being? I've been reading about cynocephaly or cynocephaly and finding it both hard to prove and hard to disprove, at least so far. There are sources online claiming that entire cities were once made up of dog-headed humans and that it was just another kind of person like another kind of human subspecies. There are other sources online claiming that all references to dog-headed people were misunderstandings, though. For instance, many will tell you that St. Christopher was a dog-headed man, a cynocephaly. Others will tell you that no, Christopher was from the land of Canaan. That made him a Canaanite. Because the word Canaanite, in all translations and languages, resembles words like canine and canid. The assumption is that this led to confusion. There were a number of historians who wrote that the people from Canaan 
were in fact human canines. So could this have once been? I have not been able to find a smoking gun myself to either prove or disprove this assertion. One of my eldest relatives, my uncle Charles in Maryland, has been in contact for me with a distant relative of ours in Romania, and they've been writing back and forth in that language that I do not understand. Uncle Charles tells me that our relative over there does believe that there were cynocephaly, or cynocephaly, in the family. In fact, he was raised with some stories concerning just this. Supposedly, this guy, whose name I literally can't spell or pronounce, said that when he was a kid, he was told to be kind to everyone because, quote, you never know when a dog might turn out to be your long-lost brother. So this distant cousin of ours grew up thinking that he had a long-lost brother who had been transformed into a dog. When he was younger, his mom would threaten him that if he misbehaved, he might wake up to find himself a cynocephaly. So it was viewed as a punishment from God by at least his mom. It was not something people seemed to be aspiring to be. And it's interesting to me that the parent would talk about transforming into a cynocephalic person. Does that mean it was not a natural subspecies, but perhaps some kind of affliction? Could it have been an illness that caused the head to become covered in hair or fur? Could cynocephaly have been a sickness more than a recessive trait? Could it, in actuality, have been something closer to werewolfism or lycanthropy than it was to a different subrace of the human diaspora? I, in fact, do have a cousin here in the United States named Doris who believes just such a thing. She was told stories of the dog heads, as her mother called them, when she was growing up. In these bedtime stories, Doris's mom would relate that their family used to be much larger, and she used to have many brothers and sisters. But when the children would misbehave, the forest itself would claim them and turn them back into animals. Each story would begin with the child having a life just like Doris's, but then each child would be bad in some way, and each would then be punished by being turned into a dog. Sometimes their sins would match something that Doris had done that day, and then she would find it hard to sleep, afraid that she might wake up with the head of a dog. Each morning Doris would climb out of bed and rush to her mirror to make sure she was still human. It gave her a complex, but she rarely misbehaved as a result. She says it shaped her into the moral person she is today, but I think it also led to her two-pack-a-day cigarette habit. That's just my opinion, though. What do I know? Returning to the two mysterious figures in the photographs, I keep going back to the feeling that these two guys were somehow involved in some form of showmanship. Possibly they might have performed together on stage or in a traveling show, sort of like a modern traveling carnival. Since the beast is shown wearing human clothing, the act might have been about an intelligent animal or an intelligent savage. Was this a man who was born with a condition causing his face to look like that, but who was otherwise a fully modern and normally intelligent human being under the fur? Could this affliction, whatever it was, have actually been the source for legends about werewolves and dogmen? I do suppose another theory I should include is that we are in fact viewing a werewolf when we are viewing this photo. That would have also been a compelling act that I'd have certainly paid an extra nickel or dime to see under the big top, watching a man change into a werewolf before your very eyes. Is that possibly what we are looking at right now? If someone were to produce an act like that these days, a man changing into a wolfman, that would become a world-famous entertainment overnight. In those days, though, if the only people seeing the act were people from small towns in Transylvania, each paying a bit of small change to sit in a tent with room for 20 people and watching the unholy transformation, it would have been very possible for the act to remain a completely underground part of the Romanian culture, something easily forgotten to local history and never heard of outside the country. 
It might have been an act that would have never gotten printed up in any local newspapers. It might have been an act viewed as illegal in certain parts. In those days, something could earn you a tidy profit while still remaining very underground to the authorities and the media of the day. Could that be what this is an image of? I also wonder if either of these men are ancestors to anyone in our family, or maybe both of them are. Since they are not labeled, I can only guess as to what I'm seeing. Was the creature captured and educated by the human in the image, who might be my ancestor? Or is the beast the one whose family line eventually led to me and my family? You know, you can't DNA test an image in a photograph, so I may never find the answer to any of these questions. Speaking of testing the photo itself, I am interested in doing just that, but I don't want to rush into it. I would need to find someone who can test it without destroying any of it, as this is a one-of-a-kind item. I realize you probably can't even tell on your end if this is a real picture or a hoax, and I apologize for that. I suppose if I were you, I'd remain skeptical until the actual article itself is examined and either proven authentic or proven to be a hoax. I am very curious how old this and the other pictures in the back of the photo book are. Neither of these two figures are in any other photos as far as I can tell, although some of them are pretty faded along with the facial features of the figures in them. I got an estimate from one man in my town to do an examination and restoration, but he wanted several thousand dollars. I'm not saying he wouldn't be earning the money, as I do believe that it would require a lot of painstaking work and research to find out exactly what these artifacts are, how old they are, and what country they originated from. I do not believe they are American, but I don't see any definitive landmarks proving where they were taken. If only one of them had people posing in front of the Eiffel Tower or Dracula's castle or something, then we might have a starting point to begin to guess. The only reason we presume them to be from Transylvania or modern-day Romania is because that was where our great-aunt told us that she and her entire side of the family were from. I mean, we never second-guessed her. Why would we? I suppose the image might be of traveling circus performers and not related to my family at all. But the photograph is not a postcard. There is nothing printed on the other side at all. If only someone had written names or information on the backs of the photos. Maybe someone did, but the ink has worn off. Again, it's possible that a forensic examination might reveal clues invisible to the naked eye. We are talking amongst ourselves of actually possibly going ahead and paying for the lab work to be done, at least on two or three of the most interesting of these images. We might just be paying to prove that the image is worthless, so this is why we haven't pulled the trigger just yet. That was when I suggested we show it to you and your audience, and see if anyone can help us narrow down what it is before we spend an arm and a leg. So, does this look familiar to any of you? If it was a show card used for a promotion of a show business act of some sort, then maybe someone in the audience might have seen this before. We will be watching the comments section of the video after it comes out to see if the image might have struck a chord with any of you. Maybe, if I'm lucky, one of you might even be able to answer my question. Do I have Sinocephalic Dogmen in my family tree? Hey, starting with this story, we're doing a new t-shirt design for every one of our thumbnails. So for this one, you can get this lovely design showing the antique dogman image, which I think is snazzy, whether it's real or whether we're having our leg pulled. From now into the future, if you would like to see one of our images on a t-shirt, poster, or whatever other merch that teespring.com sells, then just leave a request in the comments and we'll get back to you with the design link as soon as we can. I don't just mean this episode, it could be tomorrow's episode, or it could be an old favorite of yours, as long as I can locate the original art. And the best part is that not only would you be getting a one-of-a-kind item printed only for you, but you'd be helping us get through another day of keeping the show on the internet. So each new episode, there will be a new link in the description directing you to the t-shirt for that day's show, 
Unless I forget, because after all, I am only a Bigfoot. I want to thank a whole bunch of you for rejoining our channel membership in the past week or so. I want you all to know that you will be getting thanked on the show in the form of receiving an executive producer credit and shout out. Thank you for being patient. For today, our thanks goes out to this episode's executive producer, Emerald Dragon. I won't lie, and I'm not bragging. Our executive producer is Emerald Dragon. Please join us in thanking Emerald Dragon for making this episode possible. Emerald Dragon is one of our top tier channel members, and we couldn't survive without people like them. They get all our perks, including our secret uncensored stories, and our over 25 hours of archived secret stories too. Plus, returning at the end of March, seven and $10 members are gonna be able to watch episodes in advance of the public. I'm working out the scheduling for that right now, and it should be in play before April starts. The powers that be might be trying to strangle our channel, but we're going to be doing new fun things for as long as we possibly can. This way can be as much fun for you, as long as we can manage to keep doing it. They might be able to eventually starve us out, but they can't stop us from having a fun time with each other until then. And here to tell you more about that very thing is our international TV spokes mongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Thank Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 LaScary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after, I think, three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back, come back for more scary, scary stories. stories.